So who is Jesus? Oh, boy, that's a loaded question. You ask that of a lot of people, and you're going to get a lot of different answers. Um, some people are antagonistic when, just to hear that question. Uh, they get very defensive. And I think perhaps some of them may have been told, maybe from some well-meaning Christians, don't worry about all this stuff, just believe. Just do what I tell you to. Just follow the rules. Just listen to me. Don't worry about reading that stuff in the Bible. Just, just do what I tell you to do. And unfortunately, a lot of people grow up with this idea that being a Christian is adhering to a set of rules. And the ironic thing is that Jesus came, lived, died, rose again so that we could do more than just follow a set of rules. There was a set of rules that the Jewish people were following, over 400 of them. Some of them they made up themselves just so they could say they followed them. Jesus came to give us freedom. That doesn't mean freedom to remain in our sin. God didn't change His mind about sin when Jesus came. He just made it a way that we could become the kind of people that could actually be indwelt by God Himself in the person of the Holy Spirit. And that we could, we could obey God based upon what had happened to us, not based upon outward rules and regulations. I don't know how many people are like me that the last part of my body to become sanctified is my right foot. And when I'm going down the road, there's a lot of, a lot of carnality in my right foot sometimes. Because after all, I got places to be. And uh, I see those speed limit signs, but those are just guidelines for somebody else. Well, you know, so, so when we are forced to follow some rules because we somehow think we're not obligated to, you know, it's like, oh, okay, I have to do that. How about April 15th? What beautiful memories does that bring to your mind of the things that we are required to do? Not too many people pay their taxes going, hallelujah, I get to pay taxes. So we, we conform to certain rules. But you see, following Jesus isn't like that. That's not the way it's supposed to be. A lot of people live that way. It's all about external controls. Well, we started the series last week about recognizing Christ in the Old Testament. And, and the reason I'm doing this is for you to understand and to answer some questions from people like we saw in that video when somebody asks you, who is Jesus? We're, we're adding some new dimensions to this whole thing. The Messianic Jewish uh, Christians really get this right. Um, they have the best understanding of who Jesus is. Because they understand that, that when they came to Christ, they became a completed Jew. They understand all of the symbolism that, that was kind of, I guess you could say, drummed into them growing up in Judaism. They see the symbolism, and when they get free and they realize that Jesus is Messiah, then they start drawing parallels and connecting the dots. And so it behooves us Gentiles to take a look at this sometime and realize that that Jesus wasn't just something that God came up with uh, when we decided to start our calendars for A.D. The Son always existed. Christ always existed. And Jesus was always part of the plan, even from before the foundation of the world. Why? Because God, in His foreknowledge, understood His creation. He created man and women, men and women in His image, with the ability to choose whether they would seek Him and follow Him or not. And knowing the heart of what He had created, realize that, you know, there's going to come a time that they're going to need a Savior. So when we read Genesis to Revelation, we see prophecies of Jesus' first coming as a babe in a manger, and we also see prophecies of His second coming when He comes as King of kings and Lord of lords. So, we, we identified three different terms that would describe appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. Prophecy, 
typology and Christophany. And we kind of did an overview of that last week. If you missed it, you can always go back. There's all kinds of ways, I hope you know that, to watch a, a service that you missed. Uh, Facebook, YouTube, our own website, agshp.org. You can find it there. Uh, Clay goes in and, and separates so you can just watch the message or you can have a little 60-second shorts uh, on YouTube. You can watch that way. But you can always catch up. So today we're going to start down the road here and talk about prophecy. Now, you'll notice in your bulletins, there is something in your bulletin, and there's an insert in there, and uh, you can have that, uh, uh, I would say, take a, a deeper look at that a little bit later on, but I'm going to refer to that as uh, we get into the message. To give you an idea of the miraculous nature of God, to give you a sense of what Jesus accomplished, and to give you a sense of fulfilled prophecy that we have in the Word of God, and why we can trust the Bible, why we can trust what the Word of God says about Jesus, so that we don't have to go by our feelings and say, well, I think, or well, I believe, which doesn't really matter, right? Uh, so, it, this, I found this story, and I thought it was a good illustration. A guy named Peter Stoner and another man named Robert Newman, they wrote a book called Science Speaks, and it was a way to show how uh, the Bible and science are not disconnected. And in this book, they explored the odds of one man fulfilling just eight prophecies. Now, depending on your point of view, uh, there were upwards of 300 prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament. So, they decided just to take eight. What are the odds? What are the statistics that one man could fulfill just eight of these prophecies, whether accidentally or on purpose? And they, they came up with a number. They said the chances are one in 10 to the 17th power. Wow. So what does that look like? Well, let's break it down a little bit. Let's look at one in 10. Let's try to visualize that there's a man who's blindfolded, and there are uh, 10 tickets in a hat. And the man stirs these around, and he picks one ticket. The, the odds of him getting the right ticket is 1 in 10. So what about 1 in 10 to the 17th power? Well, suppose we take this, the silver dollars laying over the face of Texas, all over the state of Texas, and these silver dollars would cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Now, mark one of those silver dollars and stir it up and then blindfold a man and tell him that he can travel as far as he wants to, but he can only pick one. The odds of him picking the right one are one in 10 to the 17th power. That's providing he uses his own wisdom. So, with that in mind, let me refer you again to that insert. I found this. I didn't come up with all of these. I found it. 47 prophecies of Christ in the Old Testament. And some of them you'll recognize, that he was born of a virgin, that he would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be a son of David, and all and on and on it goes, that he would grow up in Nazareth, right? See all these prophecies, but I want to pick one that I don't really hear preached on that much, and it's number 16, the prophecy that Messiah would be a prophet. This is Deuteronomy 18 in verse 15, and here's the verse from the ESV. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So let me give you a little context on what's going on here. Moses is coming toward the end of his life. And uh, the, the uh, children of Israel have been wandering in the desert for 40 years because of their own disobedience. And it would have been like a 10-day trip, right? But it took them 40 years. So Moses is, is getting to the end of his life. Joshua is going to be the one that actually leads them in. But Deuteronomy is kind of like 
Uh, I've heard someone say a good translation of the word is again. That, that you see a lot of things repeated in Deuteronomy that we saw in uh, four previous uh, Mosaic books. And he is encouraging them. He's saying, listen, when you go into these lands, you're going to find lands with people that do all kinds of detestable things. He says, don't do that. Please don't do what they do. And he gives them a list of some things. And depending upon your translation, it's going to translate them differently. But one word that would apply to what these heathen nations were doing is spiritism. Well, we can say we're spiritual, and other people can say they're spiritual, but which spirit are we listening to, right? So these nations that they were going to displace by the hand of God, God told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob years ago that this was their land, and now was their chance to go in and possess the land. And he said, you're going to run into people that deal in spiritism. They burn their children to the false god Molech. They practice divination and fortune telling and interpreting omens and sorcery. And they are mediums and necromancers. That's when you call up the spirits of the dead. And all of this stuff, it's all witchcraft. And God gives it a name. He says it's an abomination. Now, there are some things that God doesn't like. There are some things that God calls sin, and there are some things He calls abomination. That means you can't get much worse, right? He calls all of these things abomination. Why? Because they're unauthorized. It's, it's seeking the, the forces of evil for what you want. And the only reason people are driven to that is because they feel that God isn't going to give them what they want. Right? Why else would you do that? Why do people today get so intrigued with witchcraft and the dark arts? Well, apparently God's too boring because all they've seen in Him is rules and regulations. Maybe His people has something to do with that, but they don't see true life, so they go to the dark side to try to get what they want. People, the flesh wants what the flesh wants. And the flesh will do anything it can to get what it wants. That's why we need Jesus. We need to be changed into the kind of people that can go after God instead of going after what the world offers us. God says, when you go into this land, don't do what they do. And then Moses tells them this. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you from your brothers. It's to him you shall listen. So God gave a command to not do this, but then he also promised that down the line, out of one of their own, would arise a prophet, much like Moses. And Moses instructed them to listen to him. Verse 16 says, Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb, on the day of assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. This, this is going back to when the Ten Commandments were given at Mount Sinai, also called Mount Horeb. And if you recall, the, the, the voice of the Lord was perceived as thunder and lightning. As a matter of fact, Exodus 20, 18 and 19, I want you to listen to these words. Now, when all the people saw the thunder, and the flashes of lightning. How do you see thunder? The word there, the Hebrew word is ra'ah, and it means perceive. And I really think there was no other word to describe it. The the voice of God, the best they could describe it, it was was thunderous and like lightning. Was it real thunder and lightning? I don't know, but this is how it was perceived. It was pretty powerful. And they were frightened, and they said, we can't bear this anymore. If we hear this anymore, we're going to die. So Moses is reminding them. Do you remember when at this time it would have been their relatives? None of them would have been alive. It would have been your relatives. Remember the stories about how they could not stand the presence of God? They couldn't hear the voice of God because they thought they were going to die? Moses says, well, tell you what. God says, you're right. I am not going to do this. I am not going to make you hear the voice of the Lord directly. And he goes on 
in 18, and the Lord, or 17, the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. Now, think about what's happening here. We can't stand to hear the voice of God directly because of fear we're going to die, but we need some guidance. Moses says, the Lord's telling me he's going to raise up somebody to help you like me, and he's going to be a lot like me. And, and when he speaks, you're going to be able to hear him. Who's this starting to sound like? They won't listen to the voice of God for fear. But he says, I'll put the words of God in a man. Not just any man. He's going to be a prophet from among you. I'm amazed at the lengths God will go to to offer us hope. <laughs> if any of us were in God's position then, we just said, well, tough. Let them burn. <laughs> yep. Hey, this is perfect holy God. He says, okay, you're right. You're right. Um, I'm going to do it this way. There's going to be a man that I'm going to raise up out of your nation, and I'm going to put my words in him. And through him, you will hear what I want you to hear. Aren't you glad for the love of God? Do you, do you see the love of God in this? Huh? Do you see his forbearance? Do you see his patience? God, who has the universe at his disposal, would search both ends, if that were possible, for a way to make sure that you can be saved. And it goes on, verse 19 says, And whoever will not listen to my words, that he shall speak in my name, I, may, I myself will require, will, I'll learn how to talk, will require it of him. Now, that's the English standard. The New Living puts it a little bit easier to understand. It says, I will personally deal with anyone who will not listen to the messages the prophet proclaims on my behalf. Boy, this is all starting to sound a whole lot like, more like New Testament than it is Old Testament. And God is making a promise. Whoever will not listen to my words, I will require it of him. They will be held accountable. We, we have been given an incredible gift that if we trust what Christ did for us, we can be saved. Not only, not only do we just get to go to heaven, we get a life here that's abundant and full and free. The people at Sinai were afraid to witness the power of God for fear they would die. And God recognized that they were right. They wouldn't listen directly to the voice of God, but they would receive a word from man. But you see, not listening still caused the same problem. God has not changed his mind about sin. Just because he made a way that they would hear from a man rather than directly from him does not change his mind about sin. There is still an, an accounting that has to happen. Why? Because God is perfect. <laughs> he, he cannot look upon sin. And if he can't look upon sin, how can he look upon his sinful creations if they won't trust in him to be forgiven? Because the main reason Jesus came was for restored fellowship between man and God. How can there be restored fellowship if God cannot look upon sin? 21 says, and if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? In other words, how can we know if we're hearing a false prophet? We had a series on that not too long ago. How do you know who to believe? And the people said, how, how, how can we know that we're listening to the right one. And verse 22 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. The ultimate test of a prophet is time. 
time. Well, let's talk about time. Depending on at what point in Moses' life you start looking from, there's somewhere between 1,400 and 1,500 years between time of Moses and the time of Christ. It's a lot of time. That's a lot of time. And in the 400 years between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New is a period of time of 400 years. Now, there's historical writings through that time, but there's no documented writings of a prophetic word from God. If you can imagine that, 400 years of silence from heaven. This was before Calvary. This was before Pentecost. This was before the Holy Spirit indwelled believers. And there was this silence, and the people of God were desperate to hear a word from God. And that's why Jesus was sent at just the right time. Just the right time. So after this time, you know, 400 years, not a word from heaven, the Romans had come in and had taken over their beloved land, and they're crying out saying, when? Some of them are saying, let's just revolt. Let's just overcome the Roman army, and several tried, and several failed. And along comes Jesus. And even before Jesus, John the Baptist, they were asking him, are you the prophet which is to come? And he said, no. He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As Jesus grew in his earthly ministry, people asked him, are you the prophet? Who are you? Are you the prophet like unto Moses? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record people talking about who this prophet could be. In John 6, 14, after Jesus multiplied the bread and the fish, we read, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. There's something that you, you are well to understand. When they were saying that, they, they conceived that the prophet that would be likened to Moses would likely be a different person than Messiah. So, at one point, they even asked him, Jesus personally, are you the prophet? Are you the Messiah? They were two distinct people in their minds. So, they're going around thinking, wait, we're seeing some miraculous signs here. We're seeing some crazy stuff happen that we haven't seen for a long time. We've only read about. So they're asking the questions. And they always asked him, could this be the prophet? In John chapter 7, verse 16, while Jesus was at the, uh, the Feast of Shelters, Tabernacles in Jerusalem, he was asked how he got all his knowledge. And he said, my teaching is not mine, but is his who sent me. Fulfilling Deuteronomy 18, 18, where it says, I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command. He's fulfilling this prophecy. Jesus said again in John 8, 28, 29, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority. fully God and fully man, God in the flesh, yet he took the position of a mere mortal, mortal man and did nothing on his own authority, but only that which the Father spoke. This fulfilled not only his role as Messiah, but his role as this prophet like Moses. He who sent me, verse 29 of John 8 says, he who sent me is with me, he has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. Now, other gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry uh, uh, testify that he was indeed this prophet who was prophesied by Moses. Now, on the day of Pentecost, uh, Jesus had resurrected. He had ascended. Ten days had passed. On the day of Pentecost, we hear something more about this in, in uh, uh, Peter's first message to the people. And he said, this Jesus whom you crucified, don't you love that? Don't you just love that? This is the guy who wimped out and said, no, I don't know who you're talking about. And now he is filled with the Holy Spirit. He looks him right in the eye and says, this Jesus whom you crucified was the promised Messiah. And then in Acts 3, when you read his next sermon, 
after the healing of the man that was at the gate who had never walked in his life and he jumped up, there was another testimony. And it said that this Jesus is also the prophet prophesied by Moses in Deuteronomy 18. He names it specifically. So we know that there weren't two different people. There was one. That Jesus was fulfillment of the prophet who would be like unto Moses, and he was also the fulfillment of the promised Messiah. The problem is most of the people, we were looking for a prophet, and then we were looking for a king. And they couldn't handle the fact that his kingdom was not of this world. And so many missed him, and so many miss him today, because they think he's just another teacher, just another prophet, and just another way. The Muslims claim that Muhammad was this prophet who would be raised up uh, like Moses. They added some non-biblical requirements to it, that, that he would possess the land because Moses possessed the land, although technically he didn't, Joshua did. And uh, also that he would live a normal life. So when Jesus died on the cross, they saw that as a total defeat. Although they recognized Jesus as a prophet, they call him Isa, uh, they believe he is an inferior prophet. They also believe that he would lead the people in a physical sense, that, that there would be a leading of the people into a great nation. Well, that's a lot what happened as a result of Muhammad being on earth, they are a great nation, and they are in, in all, a lot of nations in the world. But they missed the biblical, and I'm not, this isn't a, a Muslim sermon, but it, 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 it needs brought in because they do believe that Muhammad was this promised prophet. Um, they missed something, that this prophet has to be one of their own people, one of their own people. And that he is called by Yahweh himself to speak for him. The prophecy in Deuteronomy 18 says that if a prophet comes claiming any other God, they're not to be listened to. And the God of the Koran is not the God of the Bible. The character and nature does not line up at all. They could not also bear the thought of the voice of God speaking through a man because they don't understand the Holy Spirit. The idea of a Holy Spirit is totally foreign. The idea of a personal relationship is totally foreign. It's all about keeping the list of do's and don'ts. Islam didn't happen until 700 years after the New Testament was completed. So we can't rewrite history, right? These words would come true from Deuteronomy 18.22. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the words does not come to pass or come true, that is a word the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. We have definitions of a prophet from other Old Testament scripture, uh, that a prophet would not speak for himself, he would speak for God, that there would be signs following uh, the preaching of the word. That's something that New Testament believers have, right? Mark 16 says that. It says, these signs shall follow those who are ordained. Oh, no, no. These signs shall follow those who have been to church every Sunday. Oh, okay. These signs shall follow those who are evangelists like Billy Graham. No. These signs shall follow them who believe. Another thing that Jesus accomplished, never before, had the signs of God followed all who believe. Pentecost changed all of that. Like Moses, like Moses, the qualifications of this prophet had to be miles above Moses, and Moses is considered the, the greatest prophet in all of Judaism. Not only as Messiah was Jesus uh, the prophecies of Jesus fulfilled, but as this prophet that Moses listed. And this is just one of these, just these 47 that are here. And if you just take a, what I've told you today and how Jesus has fulfilled this 1,400 years apart in every way, in every detail, 
in just one area, the prophet. And then we look at the other scriptures, the other 46 that you have right in, inside your, your insert, and you put those together. And then realize that this is only a sampling, and that there were Old Testament prophecies of Christ that still haven't come true yet. We think of the book of Daniel, right, and the statue uh, that we did a study on Daniel not long ago, and the feet were ten toes of mixed uh, uh, mixed material. So it's talking about the, the mixture of nations at the time of Christ's coming, and the stone is carved out of the mountain and crushes these toes, these ten toes. When we read in Revelation about ten, the ten nations, there's so much uh, in agreement between the book of Daniel, between the book of Revelation, and what we know has not yet happened. There's prophecies of his second coming 1,400 years before he came the first time. That could maybe be another sermon for another day. But you take all that and bring it down to the average person on the street when they're asked the question, who is Jesus, have no clue. No clue. Uh, Even the slightest proof who Jesus is. And to turn that around and be so arrogant as to say, well, I believe. Let, let, me, let me give you a little, you know, something to make you relax a little bit. If someone approaches you with that type of arrogance that dismisses everything that you know about Jesus and, and tells you that you're weak and that this is all made up and it's all about controlling the masses, can I set you at ease? You're not obligated to attend that argument. You're not. You're not obligated to attend the argument. Because there's no arguing that fact. The Holy Spirit will do much more than you ever could do by just say, simply saying, can I pray for you? Amen. How do you answer presumption? If, if, if you were able to convey just this one message, the truth, the things that had been fulfilled, that no other man has fulfilled, if you were somehow able to convey that one truth, then there might be a discussion to be had. But don't, don't, try, to, don't try to argue ridiculousness. It just gets you upset. And God's not glorified. That was free. Anyway, we are living in an age of idol worship. I get to choose. I I get to make a list of all the things that I think that I want to make God out to be. And they all have to suit me. They all have to be to my comfort. And what I think and what I believe, well, if God believed like us, he wouldn't be God. Maybe you're here today, and you've been one of these people, and you kind of think, well, gee whiz, is, is, is there any proof of all of this? Get that billboard before you get off, Shippensburg exit, first one coming south. There is evidence for God. Yes. You know, I love that. There is. Faith isn't blind. It's true. Faith isn't blind. Faith is qualified by a God who is good all the time. Faith is qualified by a God who keeps his promises. The, the Bible is not just a book written by men. It's, it's a book that compiles 4,000 years of history. And the way God dealt with men over 4,000 years of history, written over a period of 1,500 years by 40 men. There is no way that this one prophecy could have been written in no way. Impossible. It's not like you sit down and started, God started writing the Bible on a Monday and finished it on Friday. This was compiled, the Word of God, and it can be trusted. This is why we trust it. This is why we build our lives upon it. This is why it's foundational to everything that we do. If we go by our feelings and our emotions, we will fail every time. If you're feeling good, Yea, God, if you're feeling bad, I don't think I can trust him. We're fickle. If you live by your emotion, 
there's no way you're going to understand the character and nature of God. But if you base your life not on how you feel, but on the Word of God, then you have days when you say, I sure aren't, I'm sure not feeling it today, but I know that. And then you, you base what you know, not what you feel, on the Word of God. And in this case, there's evidence that not only was the, were the prophecies of messianic a prophecies of Jesus fulfilled in Jesus, but here we have this one that we kind of stand alone as the prophet that was be like Moses. It's not blind faith. It's faith in the God who went to great lengths to prove himself, the, the, the God who went great to great lengths to show his love for us and his desire to redeem us and that he desires the best for us. You have a better way? I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear it. Contrary to public belief, in some cases, God is not out to cramp your style. He's not out to take away your fun. He's not out to control your life. He's not out to lord it over you. He's a gracious God that says, (laughs) I've done everything for you. Just come this way. I've already taken care of all these things that you worry yourself about. What are you doing? Why are you trying to reinvent the wheel? Come. I'm the one that spoke the world into existence, he says. Why don't you just do it my way? One man that fulfilled all these prophecies that was born of a virgin that lived a sinless life that paid sin's penalty of death in spite of the fact that he was perfect. There's no other person that lived in history that has those qualifications. There's no other person that lived in all of history that paid sin's price with his own blood. There's no other person in all of history that was completely God while at the same time being completely human. There's no other person in history that has fulfilled these prophecies that will fulfill the remaining prophecies about his second coming. We can bank on it. We can trust him. We may not know all the details. We may not know all the hows, the whens, the whys, and what all this is going to look like. But we can trust a God who went to such great lengths to prove his love for us. What if we didn't have the Bible? What if God just did what he did and really didn't let us in on it? Oh, we'd still have some understanding if the Holy Spirit was permitted to inhabit us. But we would not have foundational truths to build our lives upon when we woke up with that headache that wouldn't go away or we just had enough of the kids or our coworkers, we have the Word of God. And he went out of his way to prove himself. We see Christ in the Old Testament, prophecy, typology, Christophany. And here we've just scratched the surface of one type of prophecy, one part of what Jesus would fulfill when he walked in his earthly ministry. Jesus is the only way. He is the only truth. He's the only life. He's our only hope. Will you trust a God that has gone out of his way to prove himself, to prove himself faithful? Will you trust a God with the details of your everyday life Will you give up trying and beating your head against the wall to just make things happen on your own? Will you come to a point where you just admit that maybe God has a better way? Will you simply trust Him? And the things we can't control, we give to Him. We're not supposed to control them. We're supposed to give it to Him. Will you give him everything today? Faye, would you come? 
I'd like us to just spend some time focusing on that question. We could trust Him with everything today. I don't believe that salvation is a process. I believe our trip to salvation can be a process. But I do believe if you're born again, you're born again. The only thing that can change that is your willful decision to step out of that covenant. But just because you face trials and sickness and struggles and temptation, just because you fall and have to get back up doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. But listen, it's not just get saved and hang on till heaven. There are things that we still want to hang on to, and it takes a while for that dross to get kicked off. Sometimes it takes a lifetime. Will you trust Him today? Will you give Him everything? Will you give Him that, that thing that you keep locked away tightly in a mental compartment that you hope nobody ever sees? Will you give Him that habit that is just absolutely destroying you? Not because you have to, but because He wants to take it. Will you surrender old ways of thinking that are only earthly-minded, carnally-minded? Old ways of thinking that I have to get even. I have to do this, 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 and this. But you never stop and think why you have to do it. Will you evaluate all those things you think you have to do in the light of the Word of God? Are you willing to let go and, and lose total control over things in your life that He's not even asking you to do? And are you willing to come into this, this grace-filled relationship with Him that it, you're, 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 not, you're no longer thinking what I have to do, you're thinking what I get to do. That's the relationship that He wants for you. That's walking with Jesus. That's following Jesus. Jesus, you lead the way. Show me all the stuff I get to do. That's, that should be on the lips of every believer. Because all that stuff that we agonize over, we can say, I'm not obligated to do that anymore. I don't have to worry about this. I don't have to be a slave to this. I don't have to let food or alcohol or cigarettes or drugs, I don't have to let those things control me. I don't have to let a religious mindset control me. Oh, I better not do that, at least not in church. And we enter into this freedom that we walk with Him, and that other stuff doesn't even compare to what we get to do. So how about it today? You want to give Him something? You want to give Him everything? Maybe you've never given Him your life. Maybe you've never given Him your past. That's what we call the born-again experience where you say, I've come to the end of what I can do. I've tried to be good, and it never works. It just doesn't work. I can do it for a while, and, and when I get in a room like this, I'm like, yeah, it seems pretty good. And I go out there and ah, do the same old stuff again. You know, if, you've, if you're trying to do it on your own and you've never let Him change you, you can't expect anything different. And I know there are people, I've been to thousands of churches over the last 40 years and talked to a lot of people. I know that there are people that go to church every week who have never given their lives to Jesus because they're just thinking if I go to enough church services and hear enough sermons and sing enough songs that somehow life will get better. And it never happens because they never admit that they're helpless and maybe you're watching by stream or in this room and you've never admitted that you're helpless. <laughs> Just do it. God already knows it. God, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I can't do this. I need you to change me into the kind of person that can't wait to go do that stuff. I, I can't wait any longer for you to, to change me into the kind of person that doesn't worry about what not to do but gets excited about what I can do. And you say, I want to be free. I want to be free from sin. I want to be free from my past. And I want a new life. Today can be the start of a brand new life for you. If you say yes. Maybe there are things that you're embarrassed to think about. That still come through your mind. Can I tell you something? That's not going to stop. You're still going to have temptations. 
there's going to be stuff that comes into your mind that you wonder how in the world could a child of God think like that. But I'll tell you what will happen. He will make you into the kind of person that can overcome that. That Satan is going to try to, to mess you up. Especially if he knows he can't have you for eternity. He's going to plant those thoughts in your mind. And if you allow your mind, you're going to walk down those roads. We are all susceptible to that. If you're waiting for life to get easy, you're going to have to wait until eternity. However, he will make you stronger. He'll turn you into the kind of person that knows what to do with those thoughts. That's that overcoming life. What do you want to let go of today? What do you want to lay down? In light of the lengths that God went to, to prove himself. We looked at one isolated incident today. In light of that, you know how much he loves you. What are you willing to let go of today?